Welcome to the Christian Atheist, where faith and reason fuse in the Incarnation. Episode number 142, Malachi, My Messenger, Part 6. Malachi as the Middle, Part 1. It is time to broaden our concentration on the book of Malachi even further using it as a gravitational lens to see backward in time, even as it points us forward to a new revelation, hidden as a mystery to be revealed only when the fullness of time had come, to incarnate the messenger, Malak, who is the message, Malakuth, the new covenant of grace in Jesus Christ. The book of Malachi, which ends the Hebrew prophets and the Old Testament canon, is preceded by the books of Haggai and Zechariah. As Malachi ends the post-exilic prophets, so also the post-exilic prophets end the Old Testament prophetic tradition, begun in the book of Genesis by God himself speaking to Adam and Eve, and even before. El Yahweh, the Lord God, was himself the messenger of the covenant of which Malachi speaks. Creation was the first prophetic message the Lord God delivered, and his Son, even then the eternal, imperishable, and unchanging word of God, was Malachi, God's messenger, speaking the universe into being. And all of creation, declared by God to be very good, was presented as a gift to the crown of his creation, man. Bearing the Creator's image, God breathed into life, like Scripture, in order that he might commune with God, receive his message, return his love. The chiastic parallelism of Scripture as a whole When you catch a glimpse of it, as Jenny and I have done in preparing this series, is breathtaking, continuing as it does into the New Testament and resolving in these final words, closing the revelation of Jesus Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Malachi is the middle, the transition, the beginning of the end, and the end of the beginning. Like man in God's plan of creation, standing in the middle of the micro and the macro world, we are discovering in our investigations the mind-boggling complexity of the mind of the Creator. And at the same time, seeing his written word chiastically paralleling his character as revealed in creation. We stand in a unique time in human history. Circa A.D. 1600, both the microscope and the telescope were invented. In many ways, the entire progress of science since then has depended upon refinements in these instrumental methods of seeing God's handiwork, revealing the ever smaller complex engineering marvels of the nanoscale, the machinery of life, and the ever larger complexity of creation in space. Man stands at the middle point of that complexity, the divide between the micro and macro scale, we are providentially placed to explore the mind of our Creator. In our previous episode, I reported to our listeners one of the results of our study of current science, of God's world. That realization of my foolishness in being blinded by secular science was made possible by our study of God's Word, which has also opened up a world of mind boggling, beautiful complexity that mirrors what we see in creation. The more I have read and studied Malachi for this series, the farther afield in Scripture I have been drawn, 
first back to the post-exilic prophets, and forward to John the Baptist, then back to the prophets of the exile, Daniel and Jeremiah, whose work transitioned to the exile, and forward to the ministry of Jesus, then this week back to Isaiah and the other prophets, to the law, and to creation itself, and forward through the Acts and Epistles, to the second advent and consummation in the book of Revelation. My original vision for this episode was to concentrate only on the exilic prophets. Instead, God led us to the realization that Malachi is a microcosm of the whole of God's Word, from Genesis to Revelation. No wonder Jesus said, as we quoted in episode number 140, that it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. The Bible is not just a collection of 66 separate books, but one amazing and inseparable unity that stands alone, eternal, faithful, and unchanging. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. The whole story of the post-fall scripture is the answer to why we are not consumed by God's righteous wrath. The answer, of course, is his character, who he is, Yahweh, I am. Haggai and Zechariah the prophets, and thus their eponymous books, are the immediate prophetic predecessors of Malachi, God's messenger. As the Aaronic priest, Zechariah, is the father of God's messenger, John the Baptist. We might also suggest the interesting implication that the spiritual DNA of Haggai and Zechariah, and the greater prophetic tradition of which they are a part, like the physical DNA of Zechariah, is the father of that which follows it. We have previously made the point that Malachi simply is the Hebrew expression, my messenger, which at the very least suggests anonymity for its author, as the Hebrew word nowhere else appears as a name in the Bible. Where it does occur, it, Malach, is most often translated into English as angel, an anglicization of the Greek angelos, which also means messenger, including those instances where a theophany or Christophany is suggested. For example, two telling verses from Exodus, And the angel, Malach, of the Lord Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush. He, that is Moses, looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Exodus 3. Then the angel, Malach, of the Lord Yahweh, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Exodus 14. Importantly, then, this word, malach, is used 214 times in the Hebrew scriptures, referring to human, heavenly, and divine messengers. The cognate term, malakuth, message, appears only once, and it is in the first chapter of Haggai. Then Haggai the messenger, Malach of the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to the people with the Lord, Yahweh's message, Malakuth. I am with you, declares the Lord. The context is important. God sent Haggai and Zechariah in the same year, 520 BC, to stir up the people to action. Quote, Consider your ways. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while God's house lies in ruins? 
The post-exilic prophets begin thus with Haggai, who tells the returned exiles to get busy with building the temple and to consider how he blesses them from the moment they obey his word. Quote, Consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, from this day on I will bless you. Compare these words with the words of Malachi 3. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing, until there is no more need, then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. The theme is ancient, as testified by the words of the prophet, priest, Samuel, to Israel's first king, Saul. To obey is better than sacrifice, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Haggai tells us that Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people obeyed the word of the Lord. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. It was in this context of obedience to the declared word of God by leaders, priests, and people that Haggai the messenger, Malach, of Yahweh, delivered the message, Malakuth. I, Yahweh, am with you. Again, we should be reminded here of Isaiah's prophecy of God with us, Emmanuel. It was Jesus, the very name of the high priest of the Restoration, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, who is both the messenger, Malach, and the message, Malakuth. If we want to experience his presence, if we want to experience his blessing, we must follow his path, faithfulness, obedience, and honor to God's word. By the time of Malachi, after the temple had been rebuilt and the walls of Jerusalem restored, this obedience, fear, and blessing had already been forgotten, and Malachi was called again as God's messenger to deliver the age-old message to this stiff-necked people and her leaders. And now. O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart so shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger, Malach, 
of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. What had the returned Jewish exiles done? After receiving God's blessing for obedience to his word, they had once again turned away. Malachi makes it clear. In violation of the words of God's messengers, Zechariah, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they had married foreign women, divorcing the wives of their youth, being disobedient and faithless to God, and to each other. As a capstone, God says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words. But you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, Where is the God of justice? Hopefully, many of you recalled immediately the famous words of Isaiah 5.20 when hearing these words from Malachi. Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. It is certainly the same spiritual DNA behind them. The returned exiles were full of religious words, of religious sentiments, and with empty religious formalisms, all of which have wearied Yahweh. Woe indeed to our church today, as we repeat the failures of the past. We have chosen evil over good, inverting them precisely as both Isaiah and Malachi here assert. We have embraced the woke agenda in the name of niceness, and, as expressed here, in an inverted notion of justice. But God is mercy. God is justice. The God of the Bible, whom we have denied, in our compromises with the gods of this age. The question in the face of those who accept the authority of Scripture today, whether in or out of the church, is to challenge the very character of God as revealed in his word. Woe unto us indeed! Return unto me, and I will return unto you says Yahweh of hosts. We will pick up next episode with the story of God's signet ring. I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.